Please be seated. Now is the time set for oral argument in cause number 1CACV 18-0640FC. The case of, and I'm going to try and get these names right. If I don't pronounce them right, please let me know. Um, is it Jeannie Y. DeLint? Is that correct? Um, now known as Jeannie Beltran Geronimo versus Daniel D. DeLint. For everybody's information, we as as we have in the past, we continue to audio and video record and now live stream. It's going to be there for you if you want to see it. Go looking. Counsel each side will be entitled to 20 minutes, which is the standard period of time here in the court. And we would ask that you respect that time period. The timer located on the podium will let you know how much time you have left. And for the appellant's benefit, we want to say that. Um, if you wish to, to reserve any portion of your 20 minutes for rebuttal, please let us know. We'll do our best not to try and use up all your time on you. However, ultimately, rebuttal, saving rebuttal time is, is yours uh, as an issue. We've reviewed the briefs and conference of the case this morning. We are well aware of the facts and the issues attendant to this argument. Please keep that in mind in, mind in addressing uh, the court. Um, you decide how our having reviewed it today impacts on what it is you want to tell us. Uh, counsel, when you come to the podium, I would ask that you state your name and who you represent. And with that, the appellant may begin. Thank you all, um, and may it please the court. My name is Janet Metcalf, and I represent the petitioner um, at, um, appellant in this case. Um, I. I will begin, Your Honors, with your question about how the recent case of Barron would affect um, whether or not Kelsch payments can be awarded for a FERS pension benefit. Um, and it's my position, Your Honors, from reviewing um, Barron, that Barron is limited to um, the particular pension at issue, the military retired pay pension itself. And the court, the Supreme Court in Barron, spent a lot of time analyzing what disposable retired pay payable to a member is. And I believe, based upon the court's decision, that is because that is the part of um, military retired pay over which state courts have authority to divide and to treat as community property. And so, ultimately, as you all know, um, Barron held that Kelch payments can't be ordered in for military retired pay. But military retired pay that can be divided is the disposable retired pay payable to a member. There are two aspects of that that the Supreme Court focused on. The first part is um, the, the aspect, then the definition of a disposable retired pay. And it is defined as monthly retired pay to which a member is entitled under 10 USCA section 1408 subsection A and some numbers. That's the exact definition. Um, so disposable retired pay is the monthly retired pay to which a member is entitled. And we have to read that um, into, um, the into what a state can divide. So a state can divide monthly retired pay to which a member is entitled and which is payable to a member. So Barron set out to define the two prongs of that. What does it mean to be entitled to disposable retired pay? And what does payable to a member mean? Um, the court concluded that monthly retired pay to which a member is entitled means it has to be military retired pay, which the member has applied for and received um, approval to retire for. And been approved for. Approved for. And the president has to approve it. Um, That's what Barron yes. said. Yes. Is that is that what distinguishes retirement pay from available to a military retiree from the uh, uh, benefits that we've divided 
under Coles for a couple of decades now? I believe so, because the Baring Court spent a lot of time um, an, um, analyzing this, and it and it determined, and it actually states that military retired pay is um, unlike where the words it uses. Um, um, ASRS benefits, like the court divided in Kelsch. And it explained that it's unlike that because military retired pay um, is discretionary. And so, what makes it discretionary? Um, because a member, even if a member um, jumps through all the hoops and dots all of his eyes at 20 years of service, he can't necessarily retire at 20 years of service because the president has to approve it. Um, and then the Barron Court itself cited some examples. For example, an officer may, um, may be eligible to retire at 20 years, but he can't retire until it's been approved. He could be retained and held on active duty and not be allowed to retire. There's a war going on. Um, things like that. I don't pretend to be an expert, but such things, yes, I believe so. Um, an ASRS benefit, like a FERS benefit, um, a person, depending on you know what your job is within the first system, for example, um, you can you are eligible to retire if you're a law enforcement officer or, or you're a border um, patrol officer at 20 years of service or um, at age 50 after 25 years of service. And so while you're if you're eligible and you apply to retire, you can retire. It's not within the discretion of the president. There's not an issue of whether a war is going on, that type of thing. So, so ASRS benefits, such as were divided in Kelsch, and FERS benefits are not, the, when a person can retire is not discretionary because when you qualify to retire, you can apply and be approved to retire. It's about, different than military retired pay. What about the suggestion that, well, you're not entitled to it because you haven't applied? Um, I think that... Um, it, it, does um, that distinguish it from from the benefits in, in Kolsch? I, th I think it definitely does, Your Honor, because um, Barron was specifically deciding um, just um, monthly military monthly retired pay to which a member is entitled and to which is he's is payable. And your question was well, my question is uh, there's uh, <coughs> under. The military retirement program, you have to apply for it, and you have to be approved. Um, as I understand it, under FERS, uh, the statute says five, five USC 8412 says uh, if you if you meet if if you're a if you're a border patrol. Uh, servicemen and you you have completed your years of service you are quote entitled to retirement no approval need be need be uh, need be gained but you still have to apply for it and what does I'm wondering under the benefits at issue in Coles you have to apply for them I mean that's that's yes so so does the fact that you that the checks don't come automatically upon your birthday does, without you having lifted a finger, does that distinguish Kolsch and FERS from the military retirement benefits in Barron? Well, I think the military retirement benefits in Barron, we have the ruling and the holding that you have to be entitled to receive the payments, which means you have to have applied for them and they have to be approved and they have to be payable. You have to be receiving them before Arizona can treat them as community property subject to, to division. Um, that is limited because the court was having to define that specific statutorily defined item that the court can define. Um, ASRS benefits and FERS benefits, um, the discretion to retire is not there. You have to apply for them and be approved to retire just like you have to for military retired pay. ASRS you do, FERS you do. But there's nothing that's going to pre prevent you from actually retiring um, under um, 5 U.S.C. 8412 subsection D, which you were addressing, Your Honor, um, as long as you meet the requirements of the certain amount of service or your age. Um, FERS, you do hit a, you hit a wall at 57 where you have to retire no matter what. If you're a law enforcement officer, you just hit the wall and you're, and you're out. But otherwise, 
the retirement itself is not discretionary as it is in uh, military retired pay. How, so cost was, I just checked, was was issued in 86, 1986. Is, is, there, is there anything in Arizona practice that we are unaware of that would, that has undermined the ruling of, that ruling, or is this, or does this, are, are, are cost orders automatic in your experience? Um, I, I think that Kelsch orders are, are automatically, unless there's a provision in the plan itself that prohibits a Kelsch payment, or unless, um, as um, husband order, um, argues in this case, there's a federal prohibition um, prohibiting the division. Um, and so I think Kelsch is still good law. The Cajada case, which um, husband has brought up this morning, had to do with an Arizona public safety retirement system pension. And the difference between that case and, and, the, and the, um, the Arizona Court of Appeals decision, and I think it was February of 2019 of this year, they said Kelsch can't be ordered in that particular case. That was based on the facts of the case because the wife had agreed to only receive her to her portion of the retirement when the husband retired. And so it wasn't um, overruling or narrowing Kelsch. It was it was particular to that per that case. And Why, so, if Kelsch is still followed and routinely, and this is kind of going back to the issue of, of waiver that the Superior Court found, why is the decree silent in this case? Um, well, the decree is silent because um, there could not have been an order for Kelsch payments at the time of the decree um, because and Kelsch payments aren't ripe until a pension is mature. And so at the time of this decree in 2010, or at the at time of um, when the decree was entered and service was 09, husband was at least four to five years away from retirement. And so Kelsch can only be applied when a pension is mature, and you can actually calculate what the what the pension benefits would have been if the person retired at a normal date of retirement. I, I will grant you so, that, but the, the decree could have said that oh, it, spouse would be eligible or the, the, the wife would be eligible to receive Kelsch payments as calculated at the time of the defendant's or petitioner, uh, husband, sorry, uh, eligibility for, for pension benefits. Um, I, I agree. It certainly could have said that. I've drafted many decrees that anticipate because I have explored that and asked if a person intends or may work beyond the normal date of retirement. But it not being addressed in the decree is, is not a waiver because it was not a right which was known to wife to waive at the time. Um, I, I don't. We don't have to have in decrees things that affirm that you have rights available to a person under Arizona law to have the rights to specifically preserve them. I mean, if the law provides you have a right, you have the right. I don't think you have to, pres you know, preserve it just like, I don't know, for child, I mean, even something like child support, you don't have to say, well, I reserve the right to modify it in the future if circumstances changes, because as a matter of law, Arizona provides you can do that. And so yeah. I don't think you waive it by not including it um, in. And, and, and then the, the trial court also said that as a matter of law, Bunkowski prevented the court from ordering Kelsch payments because it wasn't addressed in the decree. But Kelsch payment, the issue of Kelsch is not ripe until the, the, the pension matures. So you're going to have to start to refer to it as Kelsch, and I will do that now. Does, does Kelsch allow for the allow power to the superior court to deny relief altogether to a non-employee spouse who wants wants to exercise her rights under that case? Is it a matter of discretion? Is my point. I don't. I. I don't. I have not read it as a matter of discretion, and um, I, I've never. Uh, honestly, I've never thought of it like that because the court was so clear that an employee spouse may not deny the non-employee's right to his or her share of the mature benefits. Um, and, and so I think if the non-employee spouse seeks that relief, the court really um, would be required to, to provide it because otherwise the employee spouse is unilaterally controlling the, the vested property rights that were awarded to the non-employee spouse or the community, the community portion of those rights at the time of the decree. Doing what we said he couldn't do in, 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 in how, 
Yes. I think what Judge Johnson is referring to is in page 185 of Kelch, which it says, in which it says, um, if the employees, but I'm sorry, we leave, we wish to leave open at the trial court's discretion the option under very limited circumstances of deferring all or part of the monthly payment owed to the non-employee spouse. Uh, it then provides that uh, if you do do that, then you need to um, provide some security, whether it's a secure by lien on separate property or an insurance policy. Okay. So, so it seems like there is some discretion. The trial court could say, look, this is too much of a hardship on the, the employee spouse. We're not going to make you make Kelsch payments at this point, uh, but you've got to provide a promissory note secured by deed to real property or something like that to, to make sure that how the, there's still assets available for the wife if, if you die before you get your benefits. I, and that, that makes sense, and thank you for providing telling me that provision. I, I think the court would have discretion, assuming that there are other equitable ways to secure the non-employee spouse's interest. Yeah. I, th I think so, yes. Yes. Um, and um, something that's significantly different in Barron with a military retired pay and a first pension plan is the first plan has no equivalent to the provision pertaining to uh, military retired pay, which is 10 USC 1408 C3, that says, because that says that a court can't order a member to apply to retire or retire at a specific time. That was the key. It was the second key. The, the Barron court focused on eligibility and when something is payable. And then second came back affirming the Court of Appeals approach in Barron that that 1408.3c3 would be meaningless if the court said, well, if we can't order you to retire, we can still make you pay the money. It said that that, that provision would be meaningless. And so that was included as part of the prohibition under federal law to prevent Kelsch payments in Barron. There's no equivalent provision under the FERS case. There's no equivalent provision for ASRS um, that, that I could find. Um, and um, so that distinguishes, that's a very huge distinction. And so this whole concept that is a condition precedent to Kelsch payments that is set forth in Barron, a person must be um, not eligible, but um, not, not just not eligible, but also entitled to retire and the pension must be payable. That is, that is because of the 1408C3 provision. FERS does not have a similar provision, neither did Kelsch. And so there's no prohibition. Um, and last, before I reserve some time, um, husband argues that there's a, a non-assignment clause um, that that FERS has that that is equivalent to the 1408C3 prohibition that prevents an, um, a court from ordering a member to re to retire or apply to retire at a certain time. Um, I I don't believe that. The non-assignment provision that is set forth in um, in 5 U.S.C. 8470 um, um, saves husband in this case, and I don't think it's relevant because military retired pay under Section 1408 has an equivalent provision, and it's 10 U.S.C. 1408 C. Um, two. Um, it's the it's 1408C2, which also prohibits assignments of military retired pay. So that's not what the Barron co Court rested its decision on. Well, doesn't doesn't 5 U.S.C. 8467A <laughs> say that payments may be made to someone other than an employee pursuant to a court decree, which is what we're talking about here? Yes, oh. and and like Barron, the same with FERS and ASRS. Um, this is all what what an, an employee spouse can receive from the plan administrator of the pension. Now, I can't, Barron has its ruling, um, it is its ruling, but um, the, the distinction between the military retired pay and FERS, ASRS, and why Kelsch still applies is there, we, there is no equivalent provision to 1408C3 that's applicable to a FERS plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsch. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Alan Cook. 
I represent the Appley, uh, Daniel Delint, and uh, thank you for having me here this morning. I'd like to say at the outset, <laughs> you know, this problem we're dealing with is a problem that's created by the legislatures of the various states and the federal government. If this were a private pension, we wouldn't be here. The Internal Revenue Code requires that private employers fund their pensions and they're divisible and this never happens. The wife gets her We were half, just saying that. Yeah, the <laughs> wife gets her half allocated to her, whatever that fund of money is, and then she can get whatever benefit she's entitled to depending on how old she is, whatever, she pays her own taxes. This only exists because there's nothing in the law that says <laughs> that the court can make a CALS payment in the federal law. There is in Arizona because the Arizona Supreme Court said so, and that's the only reason. It's not because the state legislature. And we have so. to follow the Arizona Supreme Court. <laughs> yes, you do, Your Honor. And if this were an ASRS pension, we wouldn't be here. And if it was a public safety pension, we wouldn't be here. And if it was a, a, an elected official's pension, we wouldn't be here. But, not, so but, <laughs> but. So what is there in FERS that says we can't do that? Well, number one, Your Honor, the federal government has said that there are other things that the court may do to divide these things. For example, the principal example is uh, get an actuarial equivalent value of whatever the pension is and award the wife her half of whatever that is. And that requires that a number of things be done. Number one, somebody's got to hire an actuary or maybe two people. Two, you have to decide what the discount rate is, which is subjective, entirely subjective. You have to decide how long people are going to live, totally subjective. and uh, so it's complicated, and I would ask that you keep in mind, I think the latest statistics I've seen say that parties to divorces have lawyers in less than 10% of the cases. Oh, you're t not telling us anything we yeah. don't know. So the bottom line is, almost all these cases that go through this thing, they're people that don't have lawyers. They represent themselves in whatever happens. And yet yes. Kelsch says the best way to do that is just what you described the federal statute as requiring. Well, that's correct. Come up with some other way. Figure that's out what, a present value. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, I think, God bless him. I like Justice Holohan. I worked for him for four years. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is you have a practical problem and these cases all being treated the same. They're not going to be. They're never going to be treated the same, and white rights are waived all the time. And particularly in the state code, it, it's not as bad as it used to be now that they've incorporated some IRS provisions. So you have some remedies for former spouses that didn't used to exist, but in, at the time of Kelch, for example, uh, the husband had the right to name his new wife, his survivor beneficiary, and the wife got nothing if the husband died. And so uh, that... You know, if I'm looking at that, and I think the Supreme Court did because it's mentioned in the case, that's why they're, I think that's why they're saying why should get her half now. And because it's a state pension, they can do whatever they want. And that's fine. It's not even subject to review by the U.S. Supreme Court. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a FERS pension. And okay, so what, it, what in FERS is, is different from, well, it takes out of course. Sure. Number one, Your Honor, in Barron, the Supreme Court mentioned two things in particular. It, and and I don't think it was doing so exclusively, but it did because it related to that case. Number one, they were talking about Howell and what had happened in Howell because the U.S. Supreme Court overruled the Arizona Supreme Court in the Howell case. And the issue in Howell related to wife being awarded her half of the military pension when the parties got divorced, and then husband getting a, dis a VA disability that ate up most of it. And patently unfair. I agree. That's just one of the inequities in the system. Uh, just because somebody's disabled under the VA regulations doesn't mean they can't work. Now, having been a veteran, I'd say if I lost my leg someplace, I'd be upset if my wife got half my pension from taking care of my leg. But the fact of the matter is, that was Congress's choice, and they made that decision. They said, you can't touch VA. And the state has since said the same thing. And in there is 25, 8, 530, I think, it says you can't consider VA disability benefits if you're asking for spousal maintenance from somebody who's got VA disability. You can't even include that in the calculation for spousal maintenance. So the, the states have done some things, too. But the federal government hasn't said that you can order you know, their employee to pretend he's getting a pension and pay the other spouse because he could apply for retirement. 
what they have said, and I think this is important because it's actually in the Supreme Court's Barron decision. You can't get the money until they're entitled to receive it. Now, that's the Supreme Court's word, okay. entitled. So we and, turn to 5 U.S.C. 8412. Which says you have to be separated from service. Well, it says, yeah, it says uh, who is separated and meets the age requirement is entitled to. Entitled is the word that the statute uses. That's correct. In order to be entitled, you have to be separated from service. Meaning you have to put in the application. No, it means you have to not be working for well, the federal government. That's what separated is. You can apply if you want to, but if you never separate from service, you never get a pension. How is that different from the state retirement programs that are implicated by Kelsch? Different statutes, Your Honor. They don't say that. Well, no, no, no. Surely a retiree in Arizona is not entitled to receive benefits unless she is separated. Well, what happens, that may be as a practical matter, Your Honor, but you're actually incorrect, okay? Particularly if you're talking about public safety plans, they have the drop program. Well, uh, they, can, they can retire and still keep working. And there's also provisions in the Arizona Code that say that somebody can retire and start drawing a retirement, and they can continue to draw the retirement even if they work part-time, but not more than 20 hours a week for 20 months. So there are different provisions in the Arizona Code. And I, but I get back to the point that I say, I think the Arizona Code's irrelevant, okay? The Arizona Code just illustrates that the problem in doing this is basically a nationwide problem because the federal government does not tell the states how to run their programs and the states aren't subject to the Internal Revenue Code unless they choose to adopt portions of it, which Arizona has done since. But that's a different issue. Here we're talking about a, a federal employee and like Barron, the Barron case, like military retirements, it says specifically in the statute that the pension's to be paid by the secretary concerned. It says that. It doesn't say it's to be paid by the employee. There's nothing in the federal code that says the employee can be ordered to pay this. And I don't think that that falls within the ambit of what we're talking about of other ways to compensate the other spouse for the retirement benefit. Now, what's you, in, go ahead. Do you think there's anything left of Kelsch, even as applied to uh, Arizona retirement benefits after Barron? Well, I think certainly with respect to all the Arizona pensions, I think Kelsch is still good law. I don't think... I don't think Barron or Howell or Mansell or any of those cases have anything to do with Kelch. Do you, okay, new question. Yeah. Was, it, was there any showing in the trial court by your client that as Kelch acknowledged, there's a, there, there are limited circumstances under which the court need not order immediate payment if the employee spouse is able to secure the non-employee spouse's rights? Any, any discussion of that in the trial court? I, I don't think so, Your Honor. I, I think the issue came down to a legal issue about yeah. whether or not the court could do it because the wife had never asked for it at the time of trial. It wasn't in the pretrial statement. There was no request that to be a Kelch order. And, and, and if I may, to address Ms. Metcalf's argument, <laughs> the fact of the matter is she's wrong when she says you can't do anything if the retirement's six or eight years out or whatever. The fact of the matter is you can always fashion a domestic relations order or a qualified domestic relations order to take into account the possible contingencies. And in fact, they all do if they're done properly. For example, one of the things that a, a, a retiree can do in the state of Arizona is instead of taking the retirement benefit, they can withdraw their contributions plus interest if they want to. Okay, so you provide for that contingency. And, and one of the reasons you do a, a domestic relations order or a qualified domestic relations order when the decree is done, or preferably immediately at the same time a decree is done, is so the, the pension authorities will know that there's a claim on that pension and therefore not take some action to defeat the rights of the spouse who has a, a benefit, you know, the non-pay, the non-employee spouse. And in this case, for reasons I choose not to get into, neither lawyer did that. I don't understand that, but that's what happened. And ne neither one of them are here. Neither of them did it. Neither of them are here. And one of them's a court commissioner in Yuma. <laughs> so I'm not going to address that either. But the fact of the matter is, you don't even want to know how many cases I've seen where nobody's done that. They pile up and... But there is no case in Arizona that says just silence is deemed a waiver in, the, in, the, in a Kelch situation. 
Well, there's there's a case, and I'm drawing a blank on the name of it right now, where it says that you could affirmatively say I don't want to, or I'm waiving Kelsch payments, and we acknowledge that's true. But you you, you didn't cite us to any authority that says this is sufficient to find a waiver here. Well, I think I did, Your Honor, in the fact that the cases that were briefed to the trial court with respect to this issue, uh, you know, we have a Van Loan and other cases, there's a legion of cases that say that you're only entitled to the relief that you asked for when you go to court and you're supposed to be in your pretrial statement. And these people had them <clears throat> and nobody asked for that, but it could have been addressed if somebody had asked for that. And, and, and as the courts noted, Kelch was an 86 case, 1986, and this trial was more than 20, more than 20 years later. So there's really no excuse for not knowing that it's possible, except for the fact, again, that I think, you know, Kelch is a state case. It involves a state of Arizona pension benefit. It's not a federal case. And there isn't anything in the federal law that says that you can do this. And there's nothing actually in the Arizona law that says you can <laughs> order a Kelch payment either, but for the fact that the Supreme Court said it. The state legislature didn't say it. And, and I think when you're talking about making an order that adversely impacts an employee of the United States government, that that's different than an employee of the state of Arizona. And particularly when you're talking about somebody whose job is in the nature of a, a it's not entirely military, but it's, it's like that, guarding the borders from intrusions from other, uh, from aliens and other people, and including criminals and uh, smuggling and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is, it's a pre pretty significant law enforcement uh, obligation, and I think Homeland Security has every right to expect that they're going to be able to have their employees continue to work for them but, and not have to quit to pay a pension to somebody. But but, but getting back to what yes. the statute says, yes. it, it is it is uh, the first system for for Border Patrol is, is unlike the military retirement in that uh, in the mili what what the Barron Court said in is that the military retire an application for military retirement pay needs to be approved before it may be effective. And there's some, uh, that's that's open to discretion of the government. That's not present in the case of FERS, is it? In other words, well, if an employee has put in the time and separates, as you point out, the government lacks the discretion to deny the application. I don't think, I, I'm not aware of a provision in the law that says that the federal government can make a border patrolman work if he's old enough to retire and separates from service. And I don't think there is one. Okay. But on the other hand, that also doesn't mean that he's entitled to a pension until he separates. And that's what the law says. And that was one of the keys in Barron. And I would submit to you that those keys were alternative, not joint. And in Barron, the disposable retired pay issue, in my view, was addressed <clears throat> principally because of the Howell case, where disposable retired pay can change after the retirement pay starts, which is unlike any other case. But uh, the fact of the matter is you still have the requirement that the employee has to be entitled to it. And, you know, until they actually separate from service, you don't know what their pension is either, frankly. Well, that's always the that's that, that's true under Kelch in any event, well, because you yes, could always it get, yes, it is. get a that's higher like check. Kelch too, but you still don't know. It, in 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 an Arizona retirement program, a program that's subject to Arizona law. Yes. Does the does the family court have the discretion to say I'm not going to order payments under Kelch? Yes. Absolutely. How and when does that? Well, as it says make, in the case, that the court can make other adjustments okay. to, to make another equitable award. I mean, to, sometimes. To, if the payment is secured in some fashion. Well, security is one issue. Okay. Uh, other issues are it may be that the employee has a thrift savings plan or a 401k and a retirement, and maybe you can award the 401k to the spouse, or maybe you can award the equity in the house, or maybe you can enter a judgment. And uh, with appropriate payment terms, you can do that too. But you don't think that the court has the power to say, no, you're not entitled to anything now. You need to wait. 
I think the court has the right to say that if the parties didn't agree to do something else and they didn't ask for any other relief. This is your waiver. Pardon? This is your waiver situation. Well, you call it a waiver, or they call it a waiver, I should say. Appellant calls it a waiver. I don't think it's so much a waiver as just axiomatic. You have a judgment that's res judicata that doesn't say that it was either requested or awarded. And it was their agreement. It wasn't, I don't, this was not a trial issue. This wasn't one of the issues that was tried to the court. It was by agreement. And so you have a property settlement agreement that says that. And I don't think you should get to spring something like this on somebody seven years later. I mean, the latches argument wasn't made below, but I could have made that argument too. But plainly, that's a material change in somebody's finances if you're asking the court to make an order that they pay a portion of a pension they're not receiving. Wouldn't that depend on whether there was an understanding maybe between the parties as to when he was going to retire? No. I mean, a latches argument, wouldn't it? You'd have to show that there was some kind of reliance. Well, I think you, I don't think that's hard in this case when nobody even asked for it. It's not like the case where somebody asked for it and they opposed it and they litigated it and they won. But at least then they'd be on notice that the other side wanted it and asked for it and was denied it. But, you know, one of the difficulties in doing this is how do you decide how much they get paid? Because if the alternate payee got their money from the pension plan, they'd be solely responsible for the tax consequences. Whereas if you tell the retiree, the employee's spouse, he has to pay it, then it's in the nature of a property settlement and there's no tax deduction for the retiree to do it and there's no tax consequences to the payee. And so... Wouldn't it, couldn't it be treated like spousal maintenance in that regard? Well, Your Honor, it's funny you should say that. I mean, I know Cole says you don't increase spousal maintenance to offset it, but why wouldn't it? I think that's, I think that was a bad decision at the time, but that's just my opinion. But prior to last year, tax, spousal maintenance payments were deductible to the payee and taxable to the recipient. But as of 1-1 of 2019, they are not, unless the order was entered previous to 1-1 of 2019. That's the IRS... So that's one of the tax codes. That's an IRS change? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, don't look here. Thank you, Congress. Yes. So, but, but that just needs to be taken into account now. Well, now it would have to be factored in. Yeah. So that means now you got to hire more experts to decide what the reasonable tax consequences are. And so it becomes, it's really cumbersome, Your Honor. It's very cumbersome to do this. I appreciate everything the court's trying to do here, but the fact of the matter is, it is so cumbersome and complicated. And the fact of the matter is, the plain truth is, just because the employee spouse worked for X number of years longer, doesn't mean that the non-employee spouse doesn't get more money. Because typically what happens, they work because they're making more. And so they might be getting a smaller percentage somewhat, but it's a smaller percentage of a much higher number. And so there's no showing in this case that wife actually is going to suffer any financial disability at this point. It's just an argument. As long as he doesn't die at his desk. As long as he doesn't die at his desk. In which case, she wouldn't get anything anyway. Because she's not entitled to survivor benefit because she remarried. So it doesn't matter. She wouldn't get anything. She'd miss a couple of years. But on the other hand, I would think in that circumstance, he'd be worse off. Just my opinion. I'm happy to take any other questions. No. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. I think silence in the decree at issue does not equate to waiver for a primary, for another reason that I failed to address before. There was a reservation of jurisdiction clause in this decree that provided that the court reserved jurisdiction to divide the retirement and to address any issues between the party. So I think that addresses that. Wife is financially harmed from the failure of the court in this case to order Kelsch payments because husband agreed he was eligible to retire in 2017. Had he retired, she would be receiving money now, her community portion from the plan administrator. She receives nothing. And so the slight increase that she might eventually get whenever husband decides to retire will never be, will never make up the lost money that she's not receiving by receiving, for example, and I'm just making up a number. If he were going to get $3,000 of retirement and he could have retired and received that in 2017 and wife is entitled to half of that, she would be getting $1,500 a month 
from 2017 right now, she's never going to get that money if Kelsch payments aren't ordered. And so the slight increase yeah, but she usually gets. actuarially they, they balance out. So by the, when he retires three years <clears> later, <throat> instead of getting $3,000 a month, he's going to get $3,400 a month, which means she's going to get an extra $200 a month. Over the course of her life, she'll make up that extra 1500 She got a missed a month. The first Actuarially, I don't think it would make up, especially because he was potentially eligible to retire in 2014. So from 2014 into 2019, it's five years of not receiving money. But well, I'm not an I, actuary. But I'm not an actuary either. Yeah. Um, um, second, um, husband argues that a domestic relations order should have been done to provide for the Kelsch payments. That doesn't make sense. A domestic relations order can't do that because domestic relations orders are only for plan administrators. So that doesn't make sense for a Kelsch payment. Um, um, another significant issue is there's no provision in the FERS retirement plan that restricts the court from dividing the FERS retirement pay, like the restriction for military retired pay that says the court can only treat as community property retired pay to which a member is entitled and to which the, the member is payable. There's no such provision, and that is the that is what the Barron Court rests its decision on, is that particular provision um, of, of the definition. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your argument. This has been interesting. Uh, the perspectives are certainly... Uh, worth uh, spending some time thinking about. We're going to take it under advisement at this time, and we'll issue our decision in due course. Thank you.